Good morning, and thank you for joining us to discuss UGE International's fourth quarter and fiscal 2020 year-end results. On the call today, we have UGE CEO, Nick Blitterswijk, and the CFO, Marissa Lauder. During the call, all, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Following the presentation, we will conduct a question and answer session. You can submit your questions through the Q&A tab on the top left-hand side in the web portal at any time. The management will answer them following their prepared remarks. Before management discusses the results, I'd like to remind everyone that certain statements in this call may be forward-looking in nature. These include statements involving known and unknown risks, uncertainties, and other factors that could cause actual results to differ materially from those expressed or implied in our forward-looking statements. For caveats about forward-looking statements and risk factors, please see our MDNA for the year ended December 31st, 2020, which can be found on our company profile at cedar.com and on the company's website. I will now turn the call over to UGE CEO, Nick Blitterslick. Thanks, Marcel. First off, I would like to welcome everyone to the call and thank you for joining. My name is Nick Blitterswijk, CEO of UG International, and I'm joined by our CFO, Marcel Lauder. For this webinar, first, I'm going to run through the agenda and let you know where you can find additional information. Next, Marissa will run through some of the key pieces of our 2020 audited financials and how they relate to the business. I will then provide an update on our project development backlog before we touch on the subsequent events that occurred after the close of year end. We will then take questions and wrap up the webinar. As a reminder, you, you can submit a question through the portal by submitting a question on the left-hand side of your screen. As always, our goal is to be mindful of your time and keep this webinar concise and to the point. We will be speaking relatively high level and focusing on the areas that we feel are most important to understanding our results and the business. We also want to remind our listeners that we report in US dollars, so the results in this webinar are represented in US dollars as well, unless addressed otherwise. Although we will keep things fairly high level on this call, our website address is listed here as well, where you can download our full financials. So with that, I'll turn over to, to Marissa to start by discussing our 2020 financials. Thank you, Nick. I would like to start by saying that I'm pleased to report our Q4 and 2020 results this morning. While I would have preferred to release our 2020 audited financial statements on time, we're making every effort to improve our processes so we can provide more timely and relevant content as we move forward. A lot has changed in the business over the last year. The strategic pivot we've talked about is starting to show more clearly in our results and in our financial statements. And I think at this time, it is important to highlight how some of these strategic changes are transforming our financial results and our financial statements. But don't worry, I won't talk too much shop, but here are a few critical items. As you can see on this slide, we are seeing a drop in our traditional EPC revenue, which was 1.4 million in 2020, down from almost 5.1 million last year. Some of this is due to slow down earlier in the year due to COVID, but more of this is from the shifting business model. Over time, our revenue will begin to shift to prominently revenue from energy production, which was 32,000 in 2020. As you can see at the bottom of the table, our remaining project value for the EPC business has declined to 3.5 million from the 13.4 million last year. And this is very much reflective of the change in business model. Until we reach scale in operating solar facilities, we will continue to see top line revenue pressure. This is why we are super focused on growing our backlog and moving projects efficiently through the to operating status so we can reach scale and get to a solid base of recurring revenue from energy production. This transition will lead to a certain period of accounting net losses, but projects do create positive cash flows through their development cycle, despite not showing up in the accounting revenue until operational. On the same page, you can see the significant growth year over year in our asset base. We now have just over 1 million in solar assets and construction in progress. This 1 million represents the accounting carrying value and not the economic value to UG. The economic value is better represented in our backlog values, which Nick will discuss next. 
Along with the asset growth is growth in project financing, which includes both traditional debt and tax equity financing. And this totaled 1.89 million at the end of the year. These fundamental changes represent the shift from a services business to an asset manager, where the balance sheet and cash flows become more prominent for UGE. As we build our team and processes this year, we will see some upward pressure on expenses, as we saw in Q4 over Q3 the last year. GNA increased to 1.1 million from 0.8 million last quarter, mostly due to compensation, both cash and non-cash stock expense. But we are very cognizant of being prudent and disciplined in our cost management. Moving to the next slide, let's take a slightly deeper look at our financial position. We've made good strides in improving our financial position, and with the funds raised in, December, in the December private placement, we ended the year with a million in cash. The additional five million in net funds raised in Q1 through the brokered private placement further improved that position. We've also settled operating debt and accounts payable at significant discounts as we wound down the Canadian EPC business, reducing accounts payable and operating debt by more than 2.2 million year over year. We further improved this position after year end with the further, further settlement of 680,000 in operating debt with cash and converted 590,000 of debt to equity. This reduced our operating debt to about 940,000 from the 2.2 million at year end. And of that 940,000, approximately 512,000 is a convertible debenture. Further, we also settled approximately 530,000 in trade payables and accrued liabilities. And these combined items improved our working capital position from year end. A fairly big new number on the balance sheet are the right of use assets and related lease liabilities, which have reached over 1.5 million. And to be clear, these are not cash outlays, but rather the recognition of the present value of our rights and obligations under leases for property or land on which our solar facilities are built or will be built. Mm -hmm. This number two will increase as our backlog grows. To wrap up my comments, I wanted to touch on our restatements for Q2 and Q3 2020. The summary of these results are contained in the MDNA for 2020. Between the two quarters, we are estimating an overall increase in net losses of about 538,000 from what was originally reported year to date in Q3 2020. Our audited 2020 financial results fully account for these restated amounts. We look forward to releasing the full restated quarterly financial statements and MDNAs as soon as possible, and then soon after our Q1 2020 financial results and business highlights. Thank you for joining us this morning, and, and now I will turn it back to Nick. Thanks, Marissa. As Marissa mentioned, tracking the growth and maturation of our project backlog is an important part of our business. Uh, as many of you who have been following the UG story already know, 2020 was a strong year for growth in our backlog, and we are excited for the opportunity to see continued momentum in that regard. In our latest results, we make some updates to how we present this backlog table, which I want to run through now. The first one is you may notice that this table only includes our self-financed projects, which is the focus of our work going forward. Previously, we've included the client financed and consulting project in our backlog table. Of course, removing those affects the gross total we feel provides a better summary of our main line of business. Second, we have our first operational projects in, in category six. Our operating projects are now generating recurring revenues. And as you can see here, over a project lifetime of 25 years for the operational projects in the US. Third, we have added a new column labeled capital expenditures. This column is a current estimate for projects in development or incurred costs for operational projects of the cost of building solar facilities. We have added this column to provide further clarity on the structure of the projects and as a proxy to the cost-based solar asset measure, which will grow on our balance sheet as projects are deployed. One note that any grants received, well, well, that is cash in our pocket, to actually work to decrease the value of solar assets. So that measure is listed here as well. There, there was also a relatively small amount of cleanup completed on our year-end backlog. For instance, 
instance, the, the Philippines was hit fairly hard by COVID. And while no projects have technically been lost, there was some that have not matured through the stages as initially expected. As such, those opportunities have for the time being been moved back to pipeline and will re-enter the backlog if at a later date we feel reasonably comfortable that they are back on track. Though this cleanup is mostly relevant to the Philippines, there was one project in the U.S. that we have deprioritized. It remains in our pipeline, but we felt it did not meet the threshold of being included in backlog at the present time. Lastly, just a reminder that we calculate the present value of solar facilities in our backlog that are still in development using a discount rate of 10%. For operational projects, we use a discount rate of 8%. These are the same discount rates that we have used since we began to report self-finance backlog, but in future, we will look to provide color on the sensitivity of these backlog numbers to changes in the discount rate. Lastly, we have been really busy since the beginning of this year, and our financial statements reference several subsequent events, as Marissa also mentioned earlier, highlighted by further balance sheet improvement through the bot deal private placement we closed in February, as well as further cleanup of our balance sheet. With our Q1s just a few weeks away, we look forward to reporting again here soon, including the effects of our subsequent events. On the business overall, though, it is worth highlighting that we, what we are doing so far in 2021 to build a long-term successful business. As we mentioned in our MDNA and in this morning's investor newsletter, we are building the business around the medium term 2024 goal of 100 megawatts of operating assets, as well as 100 megawatts of annual development throughput. And in the immediate future, we are looking to double our project backlog in 2021, in part by entering at least three new states. We're already well on our way. We have added key new members to the project development team, increasing our reach in the Northeast US and adding valuable experience. We have already entered one of these new states in Maryland with the announcement of a community solar project in that state, while adding additional projects in our New York and Maine strongholds as well. The early months of the year are often slower for closing new deals, but we see increasing momentum and look forward to sharing our success with you as the months and years progress. This, of course, holds true for the maturation of our current backlog as well as new projects enter construction and become operational. Lastly, I'd be remiss not to mention that we are seeing positive support on the policy side as well. Of course, back in late December, the U.S. investment tax credit was extended for two years, but there currently exists a proposal to extend it for 10 years with the inclusion of a direct pay provision, which would significantly improve the usability of the tax credits for businesses like UGE. Further, we continue to see positive movement in new states allowing community or shared solar, which we see as an important driver of, uh, of growth for our sector. Right. With that, we'll wrap up the prepared remarks by pointing you to where you can find more information. As mentioned earlier, our website is regularly updated. It contains all of our financial filings and other updates. You can also visit Sofa Capital's website for additional information. You can also follow us on Twitter to get links to announcements and other media. And thanks again for tuning in today. Marcel, back to you. Thank you, Nick. We've collected the questions investors have submitted since issuing the financial results this morning. We've also collected the questions submitted through the web portal's Q&A tab. We'd like to thank participants for sending us your questions, and you can continue submitting questions through the Q&A tab at the top left-hand side in the web portal. Moving on to our first question. Um, did something happen to the sales team to cause the fourth quarter backlog decline? And is this indicative going forward? No, not at all. Um, the, uh, I think that, um, there's a couple aspects to it, right? So number one is that the backlog that we've always reported before included client finance uh, projects and our consulting projects. And so, um, you know, there, there still are those types of projects. I know that we highlight the, 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 the amount of those, but because they're a different type of project, a different structure. So number one is that we, we, we took those off. Uh, number two is I know I just highlighted this when I was talking about the backlog, but uh, we, did a, we did a bit of cleanup the, the Philippines at one point um, had uh, what I believe was referred to as the world's longest quarantine due to COVID. So on that basis, um, the uh, on that basis, some of the projects just you know didn't didn't see the movement through the develop, development cycles or the development stages that we would have otherwise expected. And so we felt it was prudent to you know, not consider those as backlog until we see those move again. And so that was the main thing there. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of going through a few different points here, but I think it helps kind of illustrate the overall progress that we, you know, or process that we go through here. And that is in our, uh, in our U.S. market, you know, we, 
like for example, me, we closed several new projects last year and into this year. Uh, and there was one project that just we see it as having a slower development cycle right now. Um, it's still in our, our pipeline, but there was one project up there that we felt we felt it was prudent not to include right now. So it's kind of a combination of those things. But when you factor in that the um, uh, when, when you factor in that uh, you know the, the 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 gross amount of backlog doesn't include the sell, like the client finance projects, the actual change is quite minimal. Um, the other thing I'll say is you know probably a good opportunity. I, I I mentioned about new hires and things like that, but like on the overall sales team, what I'll mention is. Um, you know, number one is that in December, we promoted Tyler to chief revenue officer. And he's been doing a great job in that role, including building out the team further. Um, so since he's taken over that role, there was, uh, there was a, a couple people on the sales team that, that we decided weren't hitting, hitting their numbers and, and decided to part ways with. But also we've added several new people as well um, and, and, and uh, already starting to see the progress there. So I think, um, I'm sure I've talked before about you know, the cycles or the length like of time it takes for people to close their first deals. And so people that started this year, uh, you know, are kind of in the earlier stages of, of closing their first deals, but we definitely see really good momentum there. So we're, we're pretty excited about hitting our targets this year and, and we're very focused and working hard to do that. Are there particular states we should be keeping an eye on in regards to expected strength from the community solar market in 2021? Or are there new markets on the horizon with potential legislative changes? Yeah, in the, I'll take that as a U.S. question. Um, in 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 that regard, um, so you know, and actually, the, the the next version of our investor presentation we push out, we're we're going to update the map that we have in there that talks about the U.S. Um, community solar, as, as we often refer to it, uh, framework, uh, because there is a lot of movement there, a lot of positive movement. So, you know, in in 2017, so it was about three and a half years ago, I believe, that we announced our first community solar project in New York City. And that was a very new model at that time. I, our belief is that that was the first um, the first development of a rooftop community solar project in New York City at that time. Um, since then, it's become really quite common across certainly the, the Northeast, but, but becoming increasingly common across the country as well. Um, so, uh, so we will update that map, but you know, we've done a lot of analysis on our neighboring states of, of what it takes to have a good successful project in this in this way. Um, of course, we already announced a project in Maryland, and uh, you know, I think based on the prepared remarks there so far and, and, and so on, you know, we, we we expect that we'll see additional states um, added uh, in terms of projects this year as well. So, you know, I think it uh, it probably would be in, in the interest of everybody's time to run through every state in the U.S. right now. But I think uh, you know, throughout the Northeast. Uh, you know, not just New York City, but the rest of New York. Uh, we're seeing good mo momentum in Maryland, Pennsylvania, Virginia, um, et cetera. So, you know, we're, we're pretty excited about what that means for uh, for the growth of the sector and, of course, for UGE. Given your present cash position, how much runway does that give you until projects come online and generating high margin revenue? And what do you need to raise capital? I'll, I'll take that from a business perspective. And you know, Marissa might have more to add from the accounting perspective, but the, the biggest thing I would say is you know, the, there were a number of subsequent, event, uh, subsequent events sorry, after the close of the year, including, um, the, of course, the, the bot deal private placement, among other things. Our Q1s are, are, are coming out in the pretty near future here uh, by the end of the month. And so I think that that's probably a good discussion to have maybe at that point in time when uh, everyone's been able to look at the improved balance sheet and so on. But you know, we're, we're very focused on growing in a very pragmatic manner. We see a lot of opportunity in this space, but we also want to make sure that we don't get you know, over our skis as well and, and, and grow in a methodical manner. Do you have any financial targets or just megawatt targets? Well, the, uh, and, and we're going to jump in on any of these you like as well, but I, I'd say that the megawatts uh, in our backlog is actually something that we are providing a little bit more uh, uh, light on um, a little bit more, you know, highlighting it a little bit more than we used to. Uh, and part of the reason for that is because, um, you know, I, I would say there's probably some subjectivity in terms of how you calculate the present value, especially around the discount rate. And so that, you know, the megawatts are what the megawatts are. Um, so we have the, we have the targets in terms of the size of the backlog. And so we look forward to, to seeing that grow. Uh, we of course have targets as well in the medium term in, in terms of, uh, in, in terms of the megawatts. I think that uh, the um, 
you know, I, I think I, I, I like to believe that the information provided in the the you know, today's release provides more color for our, our analysts that cover us and, and and other investors to be able to maybe better model out the growth in that backlog and, and how that's going to trickle down to the income statement balance sheet and cash flow statement um, as that happens. So we don't put out financial targets of, of, of what we're going to do in 2021, for example, but uh, but we are looking to certainly you know continue to improve the level of disclosure and, and information that we've put out um, as, as we continue to grow here. You previously commented about being able to win one third of the backlog. Is this still holding true? Yeah, that's a that's a rule of thumb. But um, from our past results, that uh, uh, that, that that feels you know, fairly reasonable. Um, and that's uh, uh, you know that's probably a good chance to, today as well to say you know our backlog. We talked about it as a sixty uh, just over sixty megawatts of self finance projects, but. That is on top of a pipeline over 140 megawatts of projects that we're, you know, working to secure as well. Do you think your backlog can hit 120 megawatts this year? And if so, how do you get there? Yeah. So in terms of doubling the backlog, uh, that's that's the math. Um, I think that uh, in um, you know we we have grown the size of our team. Um, we have. Uh, you know, we're, we are very active in developing a lot of a lot of new sites that uh, you know typically working their way through the pipeline as we speak. Um, but in our you know in, in the various states of the Northeast primarily, um, so I think you know we've uh, uh, we, you know we we've added some, some really key members of the team, people that uh, in some cases come over from your competitors in the industry and, and provide a lot of valuable experience there too. So. You know, it's a, it's a very right market for growth. So we're you know we're just heads down on, on making sure we capture our fair share. The 2024 goal of 100 megawatts is this built out in operating by 2024 or included in the backlog by 2024? Good question. Yeah. So the 2024 goal is uh, by the end of 2024 to have 100 megawatt of operating assets. Uh, the secondary aspect of that goal is to also have a throughput of 100 megawatts by then. So you know the projects that we're securing in between now and then, of course, uh, they get built out at different stages, right? So, you know, right now, or at least as of our year end, the the operating backlog was was our was, was just under a megawatt, right? It was our first megawatt um, of, of, of self finance projects, of course, on top of over 400 megawatts of overall experience that we have. So, you know, between now and then, that's the that's the goal is to have 100 megawatts of operating assets providing, of course, the the long-term recurring revenues and so on that those projects uh, to generate. But if you just think about, you know, our, our secondary goal there of also having 100 megawatts of throughput by that stage, we're, we're looking to be, you know, very much on a on a, on a pretty pretty aggressive ramp up uh, in terms of, of how much we're developing. So, uh, you know, expecting that 100 megawatts to become even even more uh, than that in a, in a fairly rapid manner after 2024. And a clarification question: Do you only plan to do you do you only plan to convert one third of the backlog or one third of the pipeline? That's the pipeline metric. Yeah. So our our backlog uh, is you know we, we go through a process where uh, where where we decide that that yes we believe that this this project is is likely to happen and that's how our project makes it into the, the backlog. So the one third of pipeline is again I, I want to say that's a soft measure, but but that's a, an estimate for us in terms of how much of that free backlog pipeline becomes backlog. Does this filing make you current, and when do you expect to start trading again? Yeah, good question. I um, uh, no, and I, you know, I, I, I'd be remiss not to say that you know it is. Um, Marissa touched on this, and actually, I'd be remiss not to, to highlight a couple of things. One is just to thank the finance team for all of the hard work that they did in uh, in, in preparing these results and. Um, in going through the, the updates with respect to self-financing of projects and tax equity transactions and all of those types of things. But at the same time, we do regret that we, we weren't able to file on time. Um, you know, we've, we've made sure that we've kept the, the regulators up to speed. Um, our lawyers are working on, on having the, the halt lifted so we can trade again at the, at the earliest possible moment. Um, and it's, it's really the regulators of the TSX that both need to, to sign off on that. So we, we don't have a specific uh, time in, in terms of when that will be. Um, our, our understanding is that it's uh, a first half of this week thing 
um, whether that means today or or as late as Wednesday, we can't we can't be sure at this stage. And of course, we'd rather be be, be conservative than anything. But we very much look forward to that training again, and of course, keep having this behind us and and uh, and, and learning from this and making sure that we're on time going forward. A question for Marissa. Given your professional background, you likely had numerous employment opportunities. Why did you choose UGE International? Oh, well, good question. Uh, thank you for that question. I think, um, you know, I, I come from the financial services sector, and I think I made a, a, a significant comment in, in my prepared remarks about us becoming uh, a service business to an asset manager, which plays well to, I think, the background that I have in financial services, balance sheet management uh, in, in particular. So it, it is a natural um, uh, complementary skill set. So it, it was easy for me to see myself fitting in. And, and there's a, a two other reasons. And so uh, other than that, I, I love the team. Uh, I met Nick and I met Robert and the rest of the executive team. And I was really compelled by the the opportunity and uh, what I can see is some very important inherent value that just needs to be released um, uh, through, uh, you know, good management of the company. And I'm also very interested in uh, just green energy future uh, for the world more broadly. And so when I can apply my skill sets um, in what I think is a socially uh, conscious way, um, that's intriguing as well. With a 2021 goal of three new states of operation, which ones other than Maryland look the most attractive? Can you talk about the potential market size? The, uh, I think that was a question for me, right, Marcel? Um, the, uh, yeah, in terms of other, other opportunities, so uh, what I would say is, um, in, in, in no, no particular order necessarily, Maryland's definitely a state that we like. Um, you know, in New York, all of the work that we've done so far has been in the, the metro New York region, uh, so, so New York City and, and the closest uh, uh, county being Westchester County. Uh, we do see a, a good amount of opportunity uh, in, in the broader state, which of course from a geographic perspective is a lot larger than New York City. Uh, so that's an interesting opportunity too. Uh, Massachusetts is another state in the Northeast, which has a lot of activity uh, that we're quite interested in. Um, and, and New Jersey and Pennsylvania as well. So I've gone over three, as you can tell, um, and I think that speaks just to the, the large amount of opportunity that we're seeing right now. Who are your competitors and what are the barriers to entry? The, um, on, uh, I, I have to think about it this way, and, and that is that on a local level, um, for the most part, these are private companies that all or, or virtually all of the people on this call wouldn't have, wouldn't have heard about before. Um, so it's, it's, it's smaller private companies, and in the vast majority of cases, their business model is, is more or less specifically around the development of the projects, as opposed to actually building them out, financing them, and turning them into operating assets. On a day-to-day -day basis, that's the, the more common uh, type of company that we would see kind of being up against when we're, we're looking to develop a, a, a specific project. Um, the, there are some larger players that, like, when, like, for example, um, JFK Airport had a, had a public RFP, I want to say it was about uh, 15 months ago, if I have, have my time right. That was a project that, uh, that we had, had competed on. Uh, we had been uh, uh, named a finalist for, for that. Uh, it, it ended up being uh, awarded to SunPower, which is, which is you know, public information they announced that they're doing that project. Um, and so SunPower, a, a largely a residential player, but on a large enough opportunity like that, uh, which would which would have been larger than any other opportunity we've won before. Uh, you start seeing some of the bigger players like SunPower, uh, Next Era also has a, 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 a commercial division for a larger opportunity as well. So, you know, I, I would characterize the overall market as being uh, really quite fragmented still, uh, largely private companies, uh, and and also we really do believe that the ability for us to develop, build, finance, own, operate, and bring all that together under under one roof uh, allows us an opportunity to be more efficient in terms of how we bring these projects through, um, to have better client relationships with especially re repeat real estate owners, um, and, um, and, and to capture a lot more value from the work that we're doing as well. How will you deal with the risking costs in the supply chain, or the rising costs in the supply chain, pardon me? The, uh, um, 
I think on that point, um, you know, these, these things ebb and flow over time, of course. Um, and in that regard, um, like, you know, I think even in the last five years, say, you know, there was a, a time in um, uh, early 2018 when there was uh, new tariffs put on solar panels. They were referred to at the time as the Trump tariffs. And those those tariffs, uh, you know, materially increased uh, the, the, the price of solar panels at that point in time. Um, so, you know, these things, if you look at a, a graph of solar panel prices over time, uh, the, the, the trend is very clear in terms of down and to the right. But of course, it, it wobbles uh, as we go. So in terms of like the market right now, um, you know, solar panels are a technology. We see increasing efficiencies all, all the time. Of course, improving economies of scale as well. Um, I, I'm, I'm fully expecting that, you know, over the years to come, we'll, we'll see the, the price of solar panels continue to decrease uh, as, as technologies improve on the inverter side of things. That's been the case as well. Um, in, the, in the short term, you know, we, we manage the business accordingly in terms of being able to, uh, you know, be conservative in terms of our, our expectations of what things will cost to build. Um, you know, people that follow the company also know that uh, it, it can take a couple of years for us to go from securing a site to actually having that project be operational. And what I mean by that is it does give us a good amount of time to, uh, you know, ride the wave and, and understand where things are at and, um, and, uh, and, and, and make our decisions accordingly with who we're going to buy solar panels from, racking or inverters or what have you. So, you know, this is a very long-winded way of me saying that, uh, that that it's not a not a big concern of ours to be honest. I, I think it's a it's a it's a good robust solar sector right now in our opinion, and um, uh, and, and and so you know we look we look forward to continuing to see our supplier relationships grow and, and improve over time as well. What are the biggest challenges right now to move projects from backlog to operating assets for 2021 and 2022? Yeah, good question. Um, you know, I think uh, a couple things. Uh, you know, one thing uh, one, one thing I'll mention is you know, we did secure a decent number of projects in um, in, uh, in in Maine last year, right? And, and Maine is a, a fairly new community solar market. Uh, really, the first time we started hearing about Maine and community solar was in 2020. And so what that meant is, you know, we've we've secured a number of, of sites there that we're developing, uh, but but other developers have too. And so what that meant is that uh, there's there's two utilities in, in Maine, and so you know they they have a lot more work on their plate than they used to in terms of approving interconnection applications. And so we've seen that move a bit slower than than we had hoped for. Um, it's uh, it's it's right now manageable, but you know in terms of challenges for 2021. Uh, just, just from a timing perspective, I think that we had hoped to have a few of those projects into construction a little bit earlier than, than we now expect that to happen. So there's there's that. Um, I think that in um, you know in addition to that, the the sort of the the, the cloud is lifting a little bit from um, from, from the COVID pandemic, and not to uh, um, uh, you know not not to downplay you know the, the the challenges. A lot of people are still, of course, going through with the with the pandemic, but uh, but I think that, you know, I would say that anecdotally, at least, we're seeing uh, the efficiency start to return. I, I had earlier mentioned on the sales team that uh, in, in discussion of the sales team, that the Philippines was, was hit fairly hard as a country last year. But I would say that, like, across our, our various markets, uh, we, we just, I, 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 I get the sense that we're reinvigorated. And, and so, like, for example, on, on New York City rooftop projects, those move through the the, the development cycle more quickly than a larger ground mount project would, especially with all of our experience we have in those types of projects now. Um, and it, it feels like the, the sort of, you know, kind of fine-tuned machine aspect of us developing those projects is, uh, is, is, is pretty apparent right now. And, uh, you know, we're looking forward to many more New York City rooftop projects entering construction this year too. So again, a little bit long-winded, I apologize for that, but it's really a matter of getting interconnection approvals where applicable, um, some of our some of our clients, um, yeah, some of our clients specifically are doing either renovations or it's a new building, right? Uh, you know, in New York City, if you're building a, um, a, a a commercial or industrial building above a certain size, you you need to include uh, uh, a measure which is most commonly solar, um, and and so that means that a number of our clients are, are are building new buildings that we're working with them to to make sure you know that building's complete we can build out our projects too so it's really just a matter of, of moving all those things forward but you know i feel really good about the team and and um and, and and our ability to do that 
the double in the backlog, where does it come from? Is it coming from the pipeline? How much will be new origination? And could you exceed your target? The, uh, um, no, I wouldn't, it, so Marcel, if I don't, if it doesn't sound like I'm uh, answering that correctly, please, please let me know. But, um, but I'd say that uh, you know, most of the backlog started in pipeline. Uh, it does happen from time to time that something could, um, you know, uh, come up very quickly and not really spend much time in, in, in pipeline before it's closed. But, um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, you know, it's, that's typically the way that it goes about is that you know, we make a proposal and, and work it through the process to get that into a signed contract. Um, and, and then, of course, we start going through the interconnection and other aspects of the development cycle there. Um, uh, yeah, do you feel I'm, I'm missing on the answer there, Marcel? I think that's good. I think we can arrange to have clarification afterwards. But uh, just moving to the next question, what's the uh, backlog NPV as of December 31st, 2020? So on, um, and if you kind of have the slides, of course, here shared on my screen, I'll just go uh, um, oh, back to that. So so here, this is, of course, only the self-finance backlog. The NPV as of December 31st, 2020 was 105 million of, of those types of projects. And that was uh, just over 60 megawatts. Do you have any tax equity capacity here? The... Uh, you know, I'll answer that in terms of like the overall environment. Um, you know, I think if if I could speak to the industry as a whole, I would say in 2020, uh, as you know, as, as the economy uh, waded through the COVID pandemic, tax equity was 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 less plentiful in 2020 than in prior years. Um, from in, in 2021, uh, like for example, right now there's a couple projects that were were, were currently in discussions on, on tax equity, and I would say from like a, a personal perspective. We're, uh, we're, we're, we're fairly pleased with the response that we're getting on the availability of tax equity. So, uh, you know, generally speaking, it, it, it seems to be a market that's functioning right now, and, and, and we don't have any uh, material concerns in that regard. Um, I should mention too, and I, I mentioned this in the prepared remarks, but um, in the infrastructure bill that was that's already been proposed, um, and uh, and presumably we'll start seeing some progress in the in the months to come, and, and, and see how that turns out. There is a proposal for the investment tax credit to be extended by 10 years and for a, a, a what's called a direct pay provision or a, a cash grant provision um, to, to be included in that. And um, what that means is that these tax credits, you know, for companies like UGE and, and certainly all the other developers that, that I know, um, they don't have the tax capacity themselves to properly manage, uh, monetize those tax credits. And so the way the market works is that there's specific tax equity investors that come into the projects and um, and, and and will will in essence kind of pay you for those tax credits. And uh, there, there's various methods to do it. Partnership flip is the most common, and I won't go into too much detail there. Um, the, uh, the 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 point I'm getting at though is that that's it's very expensive capital to raise. It's it's of course a benefit that it's tax credit. It's free money you wouldn't otherwise get. But it is fairly uh, pretty expensive and laborious to go through that. So if um, if if it does get passed with the, the direct pay provision, that would really simplify our process of um, of, of closing on, on well, in essence closing on tax equity as we as we uh, build out our projects. And so I think that that would be you know a real benefit to UGE. Um, and also if I think about the overall solar industry for a moment, if I think about residential mid scale, which UGE is and utility scale. I really firmly believe that the, the mid-scale space that we're in is the part that has the kind of outsized benefit of, um, of, of that provision. And, and the reason is just that on the residential side, the, my understanding is the majority of residential projects these, da these days are, are, are either uh, cash or in, in more cases, uh, loans. And so what that means is that the homeowners themselves, who are of course paying taxes, they can monetize that tax credit. And on the utility scale side, the projects are so large that the efficiency of those transactions are now pretty pretty seamless. Whereas the commercial space is kind of caught in between. The project sizes aren't that big. Tax equity ends up being something that's more expensive for us to monetize. So you know we've we we've uh, we, we know how to do it. We've done it before. Um, but the, that direct pay provision would be um, would be a real benefit. And so we'll see. And, and I, I'd be remiss not to say that that, that generally speaking, the investment tax credit. Um, you know, it's been extended 
by by uh, Republican presidents before. It was actually put in place by Bush. It was uh, uh, it was renewed by, uh, by by President Trump in December, uh, and so it has had uh, bipartisan support in the past, including under um, uh, under Obama. There was a, a, a refundability clause for a couple of years after the financial crisis. So you know that's our overall sort of you know status update on that topic. Are there any risks that the current backlog does not get converted into offering assets, risks such as interest rates? Well, I would take that in twofold. I mean, it, it uh, you know, until it's operational, it's it's in backlog, and there's 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 no guarantee that uh, everything will make it through. Um, and uh, but but then in terms of uh, what's the second half of that story, Marcel? Yeah, it was about uh, the risk that it doesn't get converted into offering assets, and would interest rates be a risk? It's a combination of two questions. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, I think that that interest rate question um, is is a good one too. Just to, just to think about that. Generally speaking, I think that uh, you know we um, the primary source of capital to build out these projects is uh, is, is is debt, uh, project or portfolio level debt to, to fund those projects. Um, it is a um, I'd say a very active market. Um, we you know, we see a lot of opportunity for, for for various debt lenders. We have some good relationships there that we've leveraged in the past, and no real concerns. I think that now um, you know in an increasing interest rate environment, of course, you would need to take that into consideration. Um, but at the same time, um, the uh, at, at, at the same time, you know, UGE's volume of throughput is increasing quite considerably now as well, right? And so you know, on that basis. Uh, and I'll, I'll probably save it for another time, but like there's a lot of public metrics out there about the cost of debt of larger players and 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 uh, and, and things like that. And the reason and what I'm saying is that like you know as our volume grows, all else considered equal, we would expect our debt the, the terms of our like the, the rates on our debt to be decreasing. And so that would certainly counterbalance any any sort of increasing rate environment. What is your current headcount, and how does that compare to exiting fiscal 2020? And what are your plans to expand in 2021? The, uh, uh, the the number right now is about 41, if I'm not mistaken. I might be off by one or even two, but it's it's about that. At 12:31, um, it was. Uh, it, I, I want to say that it was a little bit more in the range of 35. So. Those numbers are directionally correct, and unfortunately, I can't guarantee that those are precisely correct. Um, the you know our, um, our 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 hiring plan uh, after we did the the financing was closed in February. We did create a, an internal hiring plan to, to plan out our moves there. And as we've talked about in our in our various documents released today, um, the 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 goal for 2021 that we set for ourselves is is you know we feel there's a lot more that we can be doing. In terms of developing more projects, we just see this as being a really good time for us to be building scale in that regard. And so, we we've made a bunch of hires, as as you see by that that differentiating uh, of, the, of the head count there um, in the last few months to build out the the, the we, we, you know development is what we call it. And within that, there's sort of origination and acquisitions and, and project development. Um, so we we built that out, and uh, and so at this point in time. And in referencing that hiring plan that I mentioned, the bulk of those changes have already been made. Um, so and I'm sure there's a couple additional people that we want to add throughout the year, but um, but it's not like we're expecting that 41 to be 50 by year end. It's 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 really right now a matter of heads down, moving more projects, you know, through the pipeline and the and the development stages here. Okay, we have one more question. Uh, are you still using a 10% discount rate when calculating your project NPVs? That seems overly conservative if you are. Yeah, no, I think that's a good question. I think that, um, you know, with, with everything going on, um, you know, with, with the, the maturation of the business into year end, um, of course, us feeling the time pressure as well, um, we, we decided to keep that as it was. So as of this table that's, of course, still on your screen here, the, the, the non-operating projects are using a 10% discount rate and the um, and the operating projects are using an 8% discount rate. So that, uh, that that's what we have right now. I, I do think that, um, you know, there's, you know, frankly, like in the public markets, there's no perfect direct comp to UGE in the, in the sense that our business model is, is unique and, uh, and so on. But if you, you, know, you can look to, 
the renewable IPPs, you can look to the residential companies, you can look and, and, and see what other discount rates are applied. And, uh, you know, uh, to a person, I would say the 10% is, is is a much higher number than I've seen in, in those other scenarios. So I know in my prepared remarks, I said that um, uh, it, it's something that we'll look to add additional color on, um, uh, you know, as, as we progress here. So we have our Q1s coming up and, and onward from there. Uh, and also, I, you know, I invite people to, um, uh, you know, of, co of course, do their own analysis of, of what that means as well. Okay, this concludes today's question and answer session. I will now turn the call over to Nick and Marissa for their closing comments. Yeah, thanks, Marcel, and, and thanks again for Marissa and the finance team for all the hard work that, that's gone into, into this. And I, I, I think that we're all you know, quite, quite proud of the maturation of the business in the, in the past uh, um, 15 months or so, and, and of course, just completely focused on moving forward. Um, I'd also want to echo what Marissa said earlier in that, you know, we, we, um, we wish that the financials had been uh, 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 released on time. Um, and uh, and I think that we've, we've grown a lot from this. We've learned a lot from this, and we appreciate everybody's understanding with that. But um, but I, I really do believe it, it speaks to the, the the quality and volume of the work that the team's doing to to build a successful company going forward. So definitely appreciate um, you know all the support, and, and and we can be reached you know at any time with any questions that anybody has. This concludes UGE International's fourth quarter in fiscal year in 2020 conference call. Thank you for joining.